Tonight, we will be starting on page 58 in the big book. Hopefully, you have your original manuscript handy online, because we'll be starting on page 58, how it works, step three. And uh, first, we'll get into our uh, prayers and do that stuff, get that taken care of, because that's important. And then we'll uh, talk about the step before we get into it. We do not represent any 12-step fellowship. We are here to share how the literature and the directions contained within the big book have transformed our lives in every way. We are here to share how our experience with our, our own experience with the journey through the steps and what the steps mean to us and how we have seen the steps change the lives of the many that we have worked with. The main focus of this study is to show people how the design, can, the design for living can work in anyone's life when the literature is understood and, more importantly, applied in a practical way what this looks like in everyday interactions and how the small moments and choices are what add up to an amazing new quality of recovery, relationships, and life satisfaction. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So we're going to pray. Okay. I'll go first. Creator. Thank you for, for bringing us here. Thank you for bringing my daughter online. Thank you for everybody who joined us here today. If you have a problem with drinking, drugging, or life, you're in the right place. This is where we get her done. Creator, I, I'm just so grateful that uh, you, you allowed me to try to carry a message based on my own burning down of my life and showing others that there's a way out. Creator, I ask for your guidance today. I ask for your words, your experiences, my experiences that you can use in a good way to try to help inspire somebody to seek your guidance in this program and a different way of life, free from anxiety and depression, fear, judgment, resentment, hatred. Create, I'm so grateful for what you've done for my life and, and how you use me as a tool in this world. I ask for an open mind today to have a new experience with you, with this program, with others with myself, so I can have a new experience with all those things. Creator, I thank you for everything you do. Hi, hi. God, thank you for another day. Um, thank you for everyone here who traveled to the book study and for everybody online. Thank you for the people that are coming back and that lived to come back. And that we can talk about recovery in a different way, that there's more than just being sober. That there's so much more beyond just stopping a substance and that we can have a life that really is free from, from fear and from <clears throat> the pressures of the world and that there's more beyond just the things that we think we need. And thank you for my friendships and thank you for the things that you haven't done in my life yet. And... Thank you for giving me curiosity around those things instead of fear. I'm grateful for that, and I'm amazed by that. Be with anybody who's struggling, anybody who's confused. Help them to hear something that inspires them and gives them insight. Uh, make the connections with people that need to be made. Thank you for that in advance. Amen. Okay, so we're going to get into it, but I want to talk first. Like, I've seen a lot of people die in this illness, right? So just an example, I had this guy that I was working with. He was a young guy. He was about 23, 24. I had seen him in the rooms for the whole time I was in the rooms. And uh, about three years in, I ran into him at a meeting, and he was, like, vibrating off the chair, and he was smoking dope in his car and coming in the meeting and like back and forth. And he just couldn't get it. Right. And then, uh, eventually about a year later, he asked me to help him and I didn't have the time to help him, but I passed him on to my buddy, Tommy. And so Tommy sponsored this guy mm -hmm. and did like wonders with him. And this guy was sober for about a year. And like, you guys know, we talk a lot about using God-centered pillars to make decisions in our recovery, bouncing off, you know, ideas and, you know, moves and what we're going to do in our lives off other people, 
And this guy called me, I was one of his pillars and he wanted to do this one thing. And I said, I wouldn't do that. And he had called all of his pillars and they all said, don't do that. And then he did it anyway. And then, you know, how that usually goes. And he got high and then he would bounce around again for about two more years, fucking on the verge of death. And then he came back and this was last year. He came back, he went to treatment and he was doing super fucking good. I can kind of had it back going on. And then uh, about six months into his recovery, he was still in living in treatment, just a second phase, I believe. And then he went out for one night and he died. And that's all it takes, right? All it takes is one, one night out or one hit. And with the drugs that they have out there now, whether you're doing meth, coke, or fentanyl, fentanyl's in everything, right? I also know a lady that uh, lost her kid because they smoked weed and there was fentanyl in the weed. And that kid only went out once and only tried smoking weed once from what I know, and they died. So when you're around enough and you sponsor enough people and you see people fuck around and fuck around and you, you anyone know Jesse here? right? He's like me. He's just different because he's the same. He's sponsored enough people to understand what the fuck happens when you don't listen, when you don't do this program. And so, you know, that's kind of why I'm like the way I am and why I'm telling you guys this stuff because we're getting into step three and step three is like a really important step in this program. You know, we just did step two. It was pretty awesome, but step three is also really awesome, but it's not like the full deal of the program. It's not, the step three isn't everything. So when you go to meetings, you always hear everyone talk about step three. It's the fucking beginning. And if you just take step three and you don't do any other work, you, you fucking don't get it. Step three isn't what you think it is or what your ego thinks it is. It's just a fucking starting point. But it has a lot of really good material in it and it's a good way to get going. And that's what we're here to do tonight. So we have the original manuscript tonight. That was the one that Bill W. wrote by himself for the hopeless addict alcoholic by himself. And this one's really direct. When you compare it to the literature in the big book, you'll see that this one like punches you in the face. It doesn't give you the flexibility. You know how it always, everyone always says suggestions, suggestions, suggestions. This one doesn't say that. And I sponsor with this one usually, and so does Jesse. And, you know, not to toot our own horns, but I've said this before, our success rates with sponsorship is super high compared to the rest of the fellowship of the program. And this is a big reason because we're very strict on our directions and what we do in the program with our sponsees. And we're not tyrants. Jesse's probably more of a tyrant than I am, but I can be tyrant-ish. Because I see what happens when you fucking, when the banana gets away from the bunch, you get skin. It's fucking real, man. So we'll really dissect this, how it works as we get going in step three. And next week, I won't be here. So Jesse's going to come in and probably finish off step three with Janine. Just a heads up. Anything? Well, I just want you to tell me if you want to read it or if you want me to read it in not a churchy voice. <laughs> I won't do that. Um, you can read it, but I'm going to reread it. So, or I just read it. So why don't you just read it? Okay. And then you talk and I'll talk and we'll save time. Okay. Okay. So rarely have we seen a person fail. Chapter five, how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our directions. Those who do not Recover. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. They are such unfortunates they are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those too who suffer from grave emotional mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. So there's a few things in this paragraph. First of all, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our fucking directions. You will notice that the big book has directions in it twice. Once in step 10 and once in step one. But in the original manuscript, it's littered with directions. 
And when you sponsor like the way I do, the book is about direction. So I had a guy um, message me today and he was wondering about, uh, no, it was, it was actually someone online right now. It was a woman online. And it was about the resentment prayer. And I won't say her name or whatever, but they were like, hey, I've been given the instructions to say the resentment prayer. Where is it? And they Googled it and they found the resentment prayer. And then they were like, well, this doesn't really look like a prayer. It's got all this, the words around it. And, and then she doesn't think it's a prayer, but it's a prayer, right? When you fucking dissect the literature and you know what to look for, you'll see what the directions are. So a good example of that is in your step 11, when you read how it works or uh, on awakening. There's a whole bunch of really fluffy shit in On Awakening. And there's only a, probably about 10 lines that actually tell you exactly what to do. But there's probably 100 lines in that reading. But there's only 10 lines that tell you exactly what the fuck to do. So you got to be like aware and start looking for what it is in the directions that you're supposed to be doing. Because there's a whole bunch of fluffy shit in this program. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. We could will these things with all of our might, but the needed power was not there. So have you been around and you just want this, like this feeling of the book? Do you want the feeling of God? Or maybe you don't even want that, but you know you need something. That's what we're talking about. Just that moral and philosophically comforting feeling is not going to fucking keep you sober. Through the directions in this book, later in the book because there's no directions right here step three is not a fucking direction step four is where they start so you can't just have like a philosophy of this program and if you try to carry a philosophy you're fucking miserable and if you stay miserable long enough you will fucking drink or put a fucking gun in your hand and then it goes in your mouth instead of a pipe because you know you can't fucking drink but who wants to live like that right so that's really important. The directions in this book, especially in this how it works, are super important to well-being and real recovery. Those who do not recover. So it's telling me, who doesn't recover? Who doesn't fucking recover? Are people who cannot or will not give themselves completely to the simple program. Those are the people that don't recover. So in this program, we have a rate. This is my rate, my stats. It's about 5% of 100 make it a year sober. Fucking hardly, most of those will not make it two years sober, okay? Two and a half out of those five people make it to five years sober. That's pretty much the fucking reality of this disease. It's easy to get a year, try getting five fucking years. But the big book actually says 50% of the people that went through this material got sober at once. 25 percent more with some relapses and 25 percent more at least had a better quality of life so it's saying 50 to 75 percent should fucking get sober why was it like that in the old days because they followed the fucking direction why isn't it like that today because the rooms are full of fucking moral and philosophical convictions galore people sharing about a fucking theory of god people sharing about their opinion on what, they're, what they think this fucking book is about. They're not sharing on the steps. They're not sharing on the directions in the literature. They're sharing on their own selfish and self-centeredness. And then people come into the program and they think that's what this is. And then we don't serve them properly. Like how many people put their name on a list to fucking be of service to the newcomer. And then when the newcomer calls, they're not answering the fucking call. That's very common. Okay. So a lot of newcomers will be like, yeah, I called all the numbers on the list. Very rare do they call them, but once in a while they will. But the people aren't answering the calls, right? Because they don't want to be inconvenienced. So there's a whole bunch of like uh, terrible recovery in the rooms. So I, what? Go ahead. I don't, I think that also it's because the book was written when there wasn't agencies of counseling and there wasn't pills and there wasn't all these different ways that people can try and get sober and I think for the problem drinker those that's all fine and good but for the real alcoholic those things don't don't seem to work and so 
if a person, and I find that the alcoholic wants the easier, softer way with everything. And so they'll come into the rooms and then it'll be like, okay, I want to do this, but it's a simple program. But what, what the program is asking to do a lot of times is to give up the things that you think you need, but you think you need them. So you don't want to give them up and there's fear going on. So it's simple, but it's hard. And so people want the easier, softer way. So you'll see a lot of times the real alcoholic has tried everything under the sun. They've gone to counseling. They've tried the pills. They've tried every, and they end up back saying, okay, what do I really have to do now? And so I think that that alters the stats and the messages that are being shared in the room. And I would agree a hundred percent. Um, we had a question online and it was Julie asking what's the difference between the original manuscript and the big book? Well, Bill W wrote them both, right? But before this one got edited and they produced what you see here, they had the original manuscript and then the first 100 and a bunch of doctors edited it. And then they took out a whole bunch of shit. And this is the original one that Bill W wrote by himself. And this is the one that, in my opinion, is made for the hopeless chronic alcoholic or drug addict. The other one is softer. So completely give themselves to the simple program. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a certain number of things that you have to do to like live a good life in this program. Some people aren't going to want to do those things. That's fine. They fucking leave and they get drunk and high and they fucking end up not doing too well. Um, but the things that you should be doing, in my opinion, are going to meetings. Um, talking to your sponsor, having a sponsor, being sponsored at some point when you're done your steps, um, doing personal inventory as per dictated in here, practicing prayer and practicing meditation, and understanding a few different things within those major components. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. So I'll say this, like with confidence, the alcoholic, so everybody in here, is incapable of honesty on their own. You will rationalize and justify the most errant bullshit in your life, in your head, to suit your actions in your life or your own inaction in your life. And the alcoholic life is the only normal one, even in sobriety. Which is why it's so important for us to be able to rely on God-centered 12-step pillars for some guidance and for some substance, substance in decision making. And I want to read something out of the step five. I opened right to it. This is why. The second difficulty is this. What comes to us alone may be garbled by our own rationalization and wishful thinking. This is step five in the 12 and 12, page 60, if anyone wants to follow along. The second difficulty is this. What comes to us alone may be garbled by our own rationalization and wishful thinking. The benefit of talking to another person is that we can get their direct comment and counsel on our situation, and there can be no doubt in our minds what that advice is. Going at it in spirit, alone in spiritual matters is dangerous. For the alcoholic, everything's a fucking spiritual matter. Going at it alone in spiritual matters in life is dangerous. Um, how many times have we heard well-intentioned people claim the guidance of God when it was all too plain they were sorely mistaken, lacking both practice and humility? They had deluded themselves and were able to justify the most errant nonsense on the ground that this is what God had told them. It is worth noting that people of very high spiritual development almost always insist on checking with friends or spiritual advisors, the guidance they feel they have received from God. Surely then a novice ought not lay himself open to the chances of making foolish, perhaps tragic blunders in this fashion. While the comment or advice of others may be by no means infallible, it is likely to be far more specific than any direct guidance we may receive while we are so inexperienced in establishing a contact with a power greater than ourselves. Urge. And then also in step 11, it says that the questions asked, why can't we take a specific and troubling dilemma just right to God and pray just to God so that he answers the questions, right? It says this can be done, but it has its hazards. We've seen AAs ask with such earnestness and faith for God's explicit guidance on matters ranging all the way from shattering domestic or financial crisis to correcting a minor personal fault like tardiness. Quite often, however, the thoughts that seem to come from God are not answers at all. They prove 
to be well-intentioned, unconscious rationalizations. The AA or any man indeed who tries to run his life rigidly by this kind of prayer, by the self-serving demand of God for replies is particularly disconcerting individual. Okay, and why we're spending a little bit of time on this dishonesty thing is because uh, on the next line, it talks about they're such unfortunate, they're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping, and developing a way of life, a way of life that demands rigorous honesty. The first principle in step one in this program is honesty. We need to learn how to develop a way of life that demands this fucking shit. This is a demand. And once you understand like what it will say in step three, as we read it today and next week, we're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion. Those two on, on their own are important to understand. We have a fucking mental illness. And like in the doctor's opinion, it says that we are alcoholics and we are differentiated and set apart from normal people. One reason we have an allergy. The second reason is we have a fucking mental illness for fuck's sakes that is in the core of us that is driven by self-delusion and fear. And until you really accept that and understand it, you won't accept this honesty stuff. And we're learning how to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. So when I work with somebody, I take them, like the first time I ever am sitting with them, this is what I tell them. I say, everything I'm going to do with you is in the aspect of learning, you learning how to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And why I'm telling them that is because I don't want them questioning what the fuck I'm doing. Because everything I do with somebody, everything has to do with learning how to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. So I had a sponsee, and the sponsee um, figured halfway through the steps or three quarters of the way through the steps that they had it figured out. That now I'm an asshole. And that now I, I'm not fucking loving anymore. And I'm not kind. And I'm not all these things. And what this person doesn't fucking get is that everything I'm doing, including the distance that I'm fucking making between me and them, is on purpose. Because I know what their fucking defects are. I know what their codependencies are. I've learned them for fucking months. I did their step five. I know where they fucking need to be pushed and, and you know, thrown into their own fucking recovery with God and helping others and doing the other things that they need to do. But they sometimes build a codependent relationship with the sponsor. And I can be aware of that. I've fucking sponsored enough people to know what's going on. But they didn't. And all I was doing was trying to teach them this. And at the end of the day, you know, once that pride is reasserted in an alcoholic, and it doesn't matter at what stage, okay? Think about when you were fucking detoxing and you fucking were begging for fucking help. Then you got like five days clean. Fucking you got to, you know, your shirt's clean and your fucking shoes are clean and you're fucking pretty good. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I don't need detox anymore. I don't need treatment, actually. Actually, I just need a job and I need a new relationship and I need my fucking car fixed and I'm fucking good. No fucking worry. Why? Because that's the pride reasserting itself. That's the ego fucking rebuilding. Undiminished intensity. 100 bucks in your pocket. Things are good and you're fucking off again. And you get sober for another week or two and maybe a month and you're fucking drunk and high and then it all, all starts again. So this can also happen later in the step work. And that's what happens sometimes, okay? So the point is, dishonesty is a... Um, so where it seems to fall off is where it says in the book, we're going to rest on our laurels, which is like when you start getting some traction with a couple of amends and you're hitting step 10, and then there's relief. Like by this point, you have relief from the destruction that was your alcoholism. And so... The, the, the ego wants to let off at that point and to not continue with the 10, 11, 12. And a lot of times people do let off and not continue hard with the 10, 11, 12. But right when you feel like you're about to let off and rest on your laurels, you'll know because you feel less motivated about the program. That's when you really got to dig in and start working with others and you're past your amends and you really got to use that step 10, 11, 12 to get you deeper 
and get you passionate again. Okay. So yeah, just that dishonesty, it's massive, right? And like later, like I just talked about most people won't make it two years. Like I can, I can see what happens. Me and Jesse are pretty good at this. And I'll call him, I'll be like, fuck, guess who fucking relapsed? He's like, and then he guesses. And he's like, it's no surprise. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. But the dishonesty bleeds into an area. Almost always the first bit of dishonesty with the alcoholic will bleed into uh, intimate relationships. Okay. So I work with a sponsee. They're fucking sober. They're fucking told me I'm staying sober for, I mean, uh, free from a relationship for a year. But they don't understand the instincts in step four. The instincts for sex relation, emotional material security, companionship. And how powerfully, blindly these things will drive you, dominate you, insist upon ruling your life. And then, you know, a fucking guy gives you a look from across the room or gives you some nice compliments or a chick. Next thing you know, you're smitten and you're talking to this person, texting, but it's nothing, right? Because we have an utter inability to fucking rationalize, justify fucking the errant nonsense. And it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing till it's something. And then you don't tell your sponsor, you don't tell your friends, you don't tell your pillars. The dishonesty is now bleeding into your fucking life. And this little dishonesty, it's like that fucking drop of dye that you drop into an, a clear pail of water. Red drop. And it kind of just starts filtering in, but it's hard to see. And then it starts taking over. And then you're on banana peel trail. And when you later down the steps, where step three is worked, Step three is worked in your step 10. Later, when you're doing your inventory in step 10, your spot check inventories, you're watching for some things. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Okay? We have a fucking fear inventory in step four. We have a resentment inventory in step four. But we do not have a dishonesty inventory. Dishonesty has to be fucking helped to be capped off by talking with other God-centered 12-step pillars. So we don't have a dishonesty inventory. So it's really advised that you fucking go to somebody. And these are the things, like we talk about humility in this program. You don't want to do it. You don't want to fucking out yourself, tell on yourself or whatever it might be. But your fucking life, like, relies on that honesty. You have to out yourself. But there's so much pride and there's all these things involved. We'll get more into that as we get later in the steps. But um, anything else? No. So this rigorous honesty. Anyone, before we go on, rigorous. What's rigorous mean? Accurate. Okay. Probably most of you in here did not have a fucking clue that rigorous honesty meant accurate honesty. You guys probably thought that it meant like fucking going at it, like w aggressively being honest. Basically, what's that? Self-willing honesty? Oh, I'm going to self-will honesty. I'm going to be so fucking honest. Urgh. No, that is self-willing honesty into your life. You'll hear me talk later about self-willing the principles in your life. That's what that is. It means getting accurate with yourself. And then pulling apart the bullshit and seeing what the fucking truth is. And the thing about seeing the truth, the truth gets deeper and deeper the longer you stay sober. And the truth at whatever point you're in your truth, everyone says, oh, that's my truth. That's my personality. That's just who I am. So that's your truth, right? Well, whatever that is, that whatever part of the journey you're on, that could be true. But when you peel back the layers of if that's actually truth or not, it's almost always based in fear. And if it's based in fear, it's based in the ego and it's not actually truth because truth is based in love. So on the, did that make sense, Shane? Okay, so as you go down the journey of life and everyone stands in their truth and they're saying, well, this is just how I am. This is just me. This is my personality. And I'm going to speak my truth. Somebody offends me. I'm going to fucking speak my truth. And then they speak their truth. And I'm like, okay. Because for me, the definition of truth is based in love. Right? 
So as you go down your, your journey of life and you are speaking your truth, you got to stop and go, is it based in fear? Is it still based in fear? And if it's based in fear, then it's not the truth. It's the truth that you're in at that moment, which isn't actual truth, right? It's kind of like saying like dishonesty has different levels and I'm, I'm, I'm not being that dishonest, but you're being fucking dishonest. This honesty only has like one basis, honest or not. And maybe honesty at that level where you're at, that's your honest, that's as honest as you are. But there might be more to that, right? So all I'm saying is stand in your truth at whatever level it is, but be on the journey to find like authentic truth, right? And maybe some of you might not understand that, but keep coming, stay in recovery. That'll click in in a couple of years. I think you're saying something along the lines of like, if you're aggressively having to speak your mind and like stand up for something or say what's up and like tell some, come at somebody. If there's like a ton of emotion behind it, you probably got to check twice because you're reacting somewhere from something. And it's usually when you chase it down to its roots, it's a fear-based reaction and it can come across like the intention and the motive are two different things all the time. Right. And it can come across like you're just speaking your authentic truth and that's what you're standing for. But when there's that push behind it, a lot of times it's coming from the emotion because there's a chill vibe when you're, you know, connected to God and you're coming at things in truth with love. There's not that, I'm just going to speak my mind kind of thing. Right. So, 100%. Yeah. 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 Like I was trying to think of an example and the examples I were that I, I was coming up with were kind of political, you know, with some things that I don't agree with. And there was a time that I was like, I won't, I won't work with this. I won't support this. And I was like, that this is bullshit, whatever. And I had, I had an aggression behind it and it felt like I was speaking my authentic self and I was standing up for what I believed in. And I, but there was, there was a fear behind it, you know, fear that society was blindly following a certain something or fear that it was going to impact my children or whatever the fear is. And I was pushing at it. And now today, those same issues. I'm just kind of like, well, live and let live. It's out of my control. I can, I can talk about it if I'm asked, but it's not something that I run around freaking out about anymore. Um, and so that doesn't mean my truth around it changed. It's that I don't have the fear that's pushing at the, the need to voice it all over the place. Now I can just stand in it quietly and just live my life according to that. If somebody asked me my, my stance on it, I would tell them, but I don't have to run around fear-based pushing at my this is my truth and you need to hear it. And, you know, so the level of intensity changes and the vibration behind it is different. And a barometer for that. And she was exactly right. Thanks for thumbing that down for me. And uh, the barometer for that is you don't have to justify what's right. You don't have to justify your truth, right? When you're working with love, it doesn't need to be justified. But when you're working with fear, it always needs to be justified. You need to prove it all the time. If you're proving it all the time, it's fucking wrong. There's work to do. Does that make sense? Okay. So, next paragraph. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. So again, our stories disclose. As we share our stories, this is kind of good for you guys in the rooms. Maybe some of you are afraid to share, you won't share. Or you're going to start telling your story in rooms, like 20-minute story or one-hour long stories. This is how you do it. You disclose in a general way what you used to be like in your addiction, the drug log part, what happened, how did you find the rooms, how did you start developing a connection with your creator or your higher power, or who helped you, what people helped you, who put their hands out, what did you hear in the first meeting that started changing your, your thoughts, and what you're like now. Um, maybe you haven't fucking changed and you're still like in the first two. Well then you got some work to do. 
If you decide you want what we have and you're willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. So that's really important. Okay, so again, directions. Um, if you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to follow directions. So when somebody comes in the rooms, they may not be ready, okay? People may sit around here and not really want what other people have yet, but they don't really have an option at some point. They're gonna go back out and try it like the normal person's way. Maybe they're gonna get sober like how Gene was talking about taking some pills. Um, doing like, there's a lot of like, you don't have to fucking not drink. You can mitigate your drinking. I've seen it on the internet. You can learn how to mitigate your drinking. Or maybe you can just take uh, whatever those fucking drugs are that, that you don't drink, right? And white knuckle it. So there's other ways, right? But most people end up coming back here. And eventually as this, as this disease fucking takes you to your fucking knees, because you're powerless over the first drink, then you're powerless over the ones that the allergy handles. So at some point, you just come here and you're beaten, hopefully, to a pulp. And then you might get willing to do what we're doing here. And then you might be willing to follow directions. But some people come here for years, and because it doesn't say directions, it's suggestions. And what is a suggestion? Well, it's something you can take or leave. But for the alcoholic like Bill W. who wrote this, you can't just take or leave what this is. And you will, like the book says, last week we read it, you'll be beaten into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes this is a tedious process. Tedious means long and fucking painful. How long and painful do you want the process to be? Because this is a, with alcohol, it's fucking slow and it's painful. This disease beats you with alcohol, slow, man. And it fucking kills you slowly. With the drugs, like, I'm lucky I was a crackhead. I was an alcoholic first. But I'm lucky I was a crackhead because crack fucking takes you from here to fucking willingness, like, real fast. If it doesn't kill you. So it didn't kill me, but it took me to willingness real fucking quick. But I came in here with nothing left, right? And like I did, Toby always talks about when you come in here with no more answers, you're, you might be ready. And I had no more answers. I didn't have a dime to my name. I didn't have my family. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a pot to piss in. I was fucking ready. I'm grateful for crack for taking me from here to here in fucking no time. Alcohol, it's like, tempts you, tempts you, and, and you just don't get it, right? Fentanyl, it'll be here. You might not lose everything, but you're dead. So what does it matter anyway? Right? What are you laughing at? Yeah. <laughs> she gets it. And some of these you may balk. You might, you might think you can find an easier, softer way. We doubt if you can. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolute. At some of these, you may balk, B-A-L-K. What does that mean, anyone? Hesitate. Hesitate, okay. Uh, Brandon's pretending like he's throwing a ball. So my favorite, right. So this is my favorite way of describing this, okay? A balk. You guys are all familiar with baseball. Let's say Major League Baseball and stuff you see on TV. The, the, um, the uh, pitcher stands on the pitching mound, and he always goes like this, right? And he has the ball, and he's watching the back catcher for the sign. And then he starts the windup. So his knee comes up, and his arm goes back. As soon as his knee passes this certain point, he has to fucking throw the ball. If he stops and doesn't throw the ball... The umpires jump out and they point at him and they penalize him. They say, balk, balk, and they penalize him. So what are they penalizing him for? Because he didn't follow fucking through. At some of these, we balked. And if we balk and we don't follow through, there's fucking penalties. And what are we not going to follow through on? If you don't understand your step one, you're fucked because you won't fucking seek this program with the desperation of a drowning man. We just spent many weeks on step one. I have a fucking spiritual malady. 
that I have no fucking control over. And that drives me to pick up the first fucking drink every time. Once I put the first drink in my body, I set off an allergy of the body. And now I'm not drinking to escape anymore. Like I put the first one in to escape life, escape you guys. But after I put the first one in, I'm not escaping life anymore. My body now is in control and I'm drinking to overcome a physical craving in my body beyond my mental control. And the spree now can last a day, week, months, or years. And I told you guys before, my last spree was fucking six years long. And then I finally got beaten into a state of reasonableness. I came here. I did the steps. I understand step one. And now I can seek the the steps two to 12 in my day-to-day life. And I don't fucking want to drink. And I learned how to turn it over in step three. But it's actually worked in my step 10. That's where step three happens. And when I do that, my life is fucking great. Because I don't run my fucking life. And that'll come over the next weeks of this study also. I really got an understanding for step one this time when I got sober. um, Just because I was in institutions and almost died and that's what it took right and that's what it takes for a lot of people most people um but from that understanding I was convinced of other things like that I had to make some sacrifices and some major changes so because I was convinced in step one that if I drank again I would really die like it had come so close that I, I really was like I can't fuck around so I changed almost everything. Um, and I, I faced like a lot of, there has been a lot of uncertainty and difficult decisions and not really knowing how things are gonna come together. But the sacrifices, and I mean like, there's been things involving my kids and there's been things involving employment and location. I mean, it has been just a big step into the unknown over and over and over. and. I wouldn't have done that if I didn't have the desperation from step one. Um, But I had to be convinced that me in step three running my own show, it wasn't going to work. And my own show looked like fuckery in relationships that needed to end. And it looked like making some hard choices. And, and so I just did, I did because I was scared to death of drinking again. And I knew that I needed to do all the things that I was up against and that I'm continuing to do those things. So I would say that these two paragraphs are probably what I find the most challenging in sponsorship because it's like, if a person wants what I have, it's like, it's hard for me to support somebody through recovery when they're like, I'll look at something and be like, okay, well, that relationship is really holding you back or the way that you're maneuvering in your work life is holding you back. Or like, you've got to just step into the unknown here, here, and here. Like these things got to go, they're in your way and they're causing your failure and you can't like grow past this stuff till you let it go. Um, and people struggle to do that. And then I struggle to support it because it's like, well, this is the way out. This is the only way that I know how to support. This is how I got to where I am right now. And so it's like, if you, if you want what a person has, you have to really be willing to, to trust them and and trust that they got what they had by doing what they're advising you to do. And that was what the process was like for me is that I trusted that, that who I was listening to knew what they were talking about and that I was going to come out the other end in one piece and not, not even just in one piece, but at, I remember saying to Bill, like, what if I make a mistake? And I was so scared. There was a couple of times I was really scared. Uh, about making the decision and that's when I would spin out the most was right before the decision and I'd be just so terrified of like the unknown like what if I come out and I'm just I can't regain whatever but I didn't have too much further to fall back because I wasn't happy in the life I was living and I kept reminding myself of that and he said like there's no mistakes then you just go the other direction you go a new way like you take another step and you've collected the information and you know that that was a step in the wrong direction and you go a different one and like as long as you're trying to step forward and so if you trust the person and the people around you then it doesn't matter if you step into the unknown and you kind of fall apart a little bit um, because you're not alone but also I see now looking back that it's like, it's only seemingly that you're falling apart anyways. Like, it's like, it, 
every time that you step into a new new thing there is a fear there and it I've had a couple of times where things have like I for example I had to make a decision to move here and so there was a lot of spinning out and uncertainty and back and forth right and I got to Calgary and it felt so right like I kept and I followed that I intuitively knew I needed to move and I just it was so strong and I knew that it was like it was what I needed to do and I've never doubted it but I finally get to Calgary and I'm like okay I did it I did it and I get served with some court papers and some big stuff I didn't like it I didn't anticipate and so this big can of worms was opened like immediately and I was like oh my gosh oh my gosh and I was in a position that I couldn't undo what I just did and I was like oh my gosh like I'm gonna fall apart I'm gonna and all these things started coming to me in my mind and what I did there was I just started reaching out like I was like I was sick to my stomach and that day I spent it like I remember that day so clearly I went down to the courthouse. I did what I needed to do there. I went to the treatment center that I'd come from. I connected with my counselor. I met him at a meeting and some other people that I was friends with. And I was just surrounded with like program and recovery. And I just, I was going through things like a zombie. And so in those moments, it felt like, it felt like I had done something that was irreversible and unrepairable and that I had made a mistake. But I knew that, um, I, I things were going to fall apart before they come together and that's often with big change and that what I'm feeling is not a fact and that it felt like everything was spinning out but I was not alone I didn't doubt my decision and and I I knew what to do I knew that I needed to be around people and I knew not to trust what I was feeling in my head my thoughts that were creating the anxiety because the the feeling I had in my heart like in my like I don't even know how to explain it to 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 move and that intuitive thought that's not my real thinking that's like something on a different level and I trusted that and so that anchored me when I started to you know go all over the place and when I couldn't get anchored myself I had enough people who were around me that could help me out but I went into it knowing like that things can go all kinds of ways but I'm I'm not by myself and I can be grounded in a higher power somehow, even though like it felt like everything was so fucking, it was an insane time of my life, but I held on to the fact that I was doing what I was led to do and that things get rocky. Like when you're called to do something and when like, whether it's to change a job or have a hard conversation or whatever it is that's in front of you that looks so scary, it's, it's not, it's not the norm that you go and do something scary and then everything's just all good. Like it is the norm that you do something scary and then things kind of do a bit of a dust storm and that in the dust storm, you don't know if you made the right decision and you got to cling to the intuitive part of you that led you to make the decision in the first place. And then the dust settles and the dust does settle. But when you make a change, you kick dust up and you got to like hold on to that and not get freaked out and be around the people who can support it properly. Because when you do make the changes, you do kick up dust and it takes a minute to settle into what you've just done. So like changes are scary, but you can hold on and like get through it. So I don't know why I just told you all of those things. If anybody needed to hear that maybe, but that was it, what it was like for me. Okay. So I'm going to keep going. We're going to break pretty quick, but just give me a few more minutes here. So just in respect to what Janine was just talking about. Um, with all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. And she displayed, she was very fearless and thorough through that process, right? Um, some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. So she was explaining how these old ideas were trying to pull her back, right? The old ideas are my old ideas, emotions, and attitudes. How I fucking navigate life. If I drink and use drugs and pick up this fucking substance because of my old ideas, my ideas, emotions, and attitudes, then if I don't fucking expose them and change them, my brain will always need the relief from the same thinking that it's always thought. And that's my old ideas. And if I don't know what my old ideas are, then I can't change them. And if I just try to self-will the change in my own psyche, in my own life, 
most people do like external changes because they want change. So they'll change their relationship. They'll change where they live. They'll change their job. They'll change their clothing, how they look, and they'll do all these external changes. But that change doesn't fucking rear any real benefit for the alcoholic addict. What it does is it allows you to relapse constantly for fucking years and years and years. And if you have step one solid and you know you're fucked if you drink, then you just become fucking anxious, depressed, and miserable and don't even want to fucking participate in life. And this is a disease of isolation. So it'll take you and fucking put you in a fucking corner again by yourself fucking sober. That's what it does. So the old ideas need to be exposed, extracted, looked at. And the only way to change that shit is with a power greater than ourselves. If you were able to change with your own power, you would have. If you were able to change with a psychologist or a counselor or whatever, you would have. There's a power that you haven't tapped into. It's called fucking creator, God, source. That power will fucking help you change if you want to fucking change. And it's helped me change, which is why I'm here. And my daughter who's online can tell you how fucking angry and violent I used to be and how much of an angel I am today. I was just going to add, but you use the power combined with action. That's how you change because the fear stops you from making the action. You use the higher power and you take the action and through the new experiences that are created from the action you just took changes your thinking because now you have new experiences around you. You did something different. You got a new experience that gets into the thinking and the feeling and then you've got that data you know and over time you come to believe and you can do it easier and easier but it takes action to create a new experience and so you use god to take the action to get the new experience mm -hmm. okay so we are fourth paragraph down basically it's a sentence long remember that you are dealing with alcohol cunning baffling powerful Without help, it is too much for you. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. You must find him now. So where it talks about, remember, you are dealing with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. You know, I go to a lot of meetings. And I hear that, right? And people are like, fuck, alcohol so cunning. It's so cunning and baffling and powerful. No, it ain't, man. It's a fucking liquid. It's not that fucking smart. Trust me. It's the fucking illness in your head. Why you pick it up is what's cunning. Self is cunning. The self-delusion and the fear is cunning. That's the stuff we got to watch out for. You know, I, I'm picking up a drink or a drug because of that other cunning shit. Not because of this fucking liquid or that powder. So that's important. It's not the alcohol that's cunning. Like, seriously. It's the fucking instincts it's your defects of character you're powerless over your defects of character you're powerless over your desire for sex relation for that desire for that emotional security that you can get from a person you're powerless over that shit so that stuff drives your life powerfully blindly many times subtly these things drive us dominate us insist upon ruling our life I talked last week about, uh, you know, the dude who fucking gets up in the morning and every single thought in that guy's mind is how can he look good for the fucking women in, in the world? From the fucking haircut that he gets, to the watch that he puts on, to the shoes, to the pants, to the fucking hair. Every aspect of that guy's life is driven by how he fucking looks to the opposite sex. And we talked about worship. That guy's worshiping fucking validation. He needs validation. That guy's worshiping, possibly he's really lacking in the emotional security within his own fucking being. And he's fucking trying to get that from, from some people, right? And if he doesn't get it, he doesn't feel fucking like he's confident within himself because he's not getting it from external. When we talk about tradition seven, right? 
Um, AA is self-supporting through its own contributions, declining outside contribution. Then everyone takes the basket and goes around and you put money in the basket. And everyone thinks tradition seven is about self-supporting through money. When you take the tradition and you bring it over to the step, it means you become fucking self-supporting through your own being okay with who the fuck you are. That you can decline outside contributions of people, places, and things, and validation, and whatever. And you can be okay with who you fucking are. And when you get to that place, you don't need to fucking justify anything. You don't need anything from anybody else. Because you and God have fucking aligned, and you're okay with who you are. And that process of becoming okay with who you are doesn't happen just because you wanted to. It doesn't happen coming in here and fucking theoretically trying to figure out the program on a theoretical basis and just being nice. Being nice doesn't mean you're spiritual, right? When we talk about spiritual components in, in life out there in that world, they talk about prayer and meditation pretty much only. Here, the most important part of spirituality is the fucking personal look at yourself. What and who you are. And fucking humbling yourself with fucking humiliation and pain to go, yeah, I am fucking that. I am a validation fucking whore. I am fucking angry as fuck and I am a val um, violent. And why am I? Because I didn't want to be violent. I didn't want to be angry. I didn't want to be lustful. I didn't want to be all these things. I didn't want to fucking hate people. I wanted to be free of that, but I didn't even know that you could be because I just thought that was life. Until I came here and I did the most important spiritual work that there is, looking at myself in the fucking step work and admitting things that I did not like about myself and then becoming willing to fucking change it, right? So that's the cunning stuff. And when you first get here and you separate yourself from a substance, that's like the barest beginning. That's like the barest fucking beginning. You got to get into the work and then start seeing what we're really doing here. That's why people don't stay sober in this program. Because they don't really fucking get that that's what we're doing here. But when you're in this literature and you see what it's actually saying, you're seeing that that's what it's talking about. It's fucking barely even talked about alcohol since step one. Like barely. That's the first word of alcohol, I think, since step one. Right there. Because alcohol is not the issue. Selfish self-centeredness is the issue. Okay. And without help, it's too much for you. But there is one who has all power. That one is God, period. You must find him now. So in the big book, in the original how it works, it says, may you find him now. Maybe. May you. I guess there's a possibility. But for the real deal alcoholic who suffers, you must fucking better find him, man. You better fucking find God. And the thing about God is you don't need to go looking fucking for God. God's not over there. God's not in the man. God's not in the woman. God's no longer in the money, in the fucking clothes. There's no more God out there. You just got to clear away all the shit that's not God because the fundamental idea of God is right fucking here. So then every man, woman, and child. But what's happened? It's often obscured. It means blocked off. By calamity, pomp, and worship of other things. It's the pomp of self and the worship of other things that creates the calamity and obscures God within you. So if you want to find that unsuspected inner resource, resource, the unsuspected one right here, you got to look for it. You got to be willing to go through some of that pain that she was talking about. Because through that pain is where it is. You got to take the shit that's not God anymore. That's where that authentic truth lies. It's right in there. And finding that is important. And you must find him now. I love that. It doesn't mince words. So when I take a new guy through this material in the original manuscript, it's very fucking clear. It doesn't fuck around. You better find God or you're fucking screwed. That comes from uh, We Agnostics in step two, where it says the fundamental idea of God is within every man, woman, and child but it's often obscured. I counted like five different topics you went through in that paragraph there. 
So I was going to talk and then I'm like, no, I'll let him finish. No, then he did another that's, one. Now you know what it's like talking to the phone. Like, I'm serious. I'll fucking oh, talk to her on the phone. And then I'm like, I have like a good thought about that topic. And then she doesn't stop, right? And then fucking like 10 minutes later, I've had like 10 good thoughts, but I can't even remember anything by the end of it. And I'm just like, okay, bye. And then I'm just sitting there kind of stunned. I'm dead serious. <laughs> remember I mentioned yes, that to you like last that. week? Okay. Well, all I was going to add was like, the, I, I use this to ground people and myself back to like, when people are thinking way too much in the future or even just about tomorrow, things that haven't happened and their future thinking and giving themselves anxiety or they're thinking about the past and the things they did and they shouldn't have done it and the regret and all of those things. It's like God is not in the, in the past and God's not in the future. God is only right now. God's in this moment and he cannot be found in the past or in the future. What do you need to do in this moment to find God? And that's do the next thing in front of you with truth and love, whatever that is. And on that note, what is step 10 about? It's about here, right now. It's about presence, right here and now. Continuing to wash for my defects, going to God and asking him to remove it right now, talking to somebody immediately, making amends quickly if I have harmed anyone, and resolutely turning my thoughts to other people that I can help and be helpful through prayer. Step 10 is presence now. And so I really want to highlight step three worked in step 10, all through the study. How does that come together? Well, it comes together through the understanding of step six, but I don't want to confuse you. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. Go for it. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Throw, throw yourself under his protection and care with complete abandon. I just wanted to move to the next paragraph. Do you want to talk? Well, half measures avail you nothing. So anyone here does half measures before? Wyatt, how'd that work out? Shane, how's half measures work for you? Right? Anyone else want to share on how half measures worked really well? Christy, I know you want to share on that. I'm kidding right and and what i love about you i'm going to use you as an example and if you want to be added out of this you definitely can be um i met you through our daughters and uh i was in recovery and our youngest daughters their best friends and then um my daughter had told christy about me and then i connected with her and then she started coming around recovery a little bit and she wasn't quite, she was half measuring it, right? And then it ended up not working out well. And like that being beaten into a state of reasonableness. And like, now I see you come and like you're full of life and you're fucking attentive and you fucking know, right? And you've tried all the other things. And now you're like, okay, there's one thing here that I know works. And like, so you, you fucking try hard, right? And you show up, right? And she lives like way the fuck far away. And she drives all the way here for this study, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes, right? Mm -hmm. It catches you off guard. You know, you can you can back away from what this is and then things can be okay for a bit. And then, then they're not. And it doesn't take much to knock a person down. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying. It's like when drinking isn't an option anymore and that that is there's a time when drinking isn't an option the alcoholic brain doesn't go there anymore but it certainly goes to the death thoughts and the yeah yeah and like at first if the drink's not available it's going to be relationships it's going to be you know i'll use men i've sponsored more men it's going to be relationship it's going to be sex it's going to be porn it's going to be gambling it's going to be but when all these things fail you're still the guy's still stuck with himself <laughs> And like when you get to that point where nothing fucking works and you don't really know that there's actually a solution here because you haven't heard that in the, in the rooms because a lot of rooms don't carry the solution. They carry a bunch of bullshit. And then you're like, is this all sobriety is? Is this it? And then, you know, it doesn't end up good. A lot of people commit suicide sober in this program, right? So 
it's good to have you here and hopefully you know you're getting something out of it and hopefully you're getting something out of it and uh, hopefully you guys come back because you know this is just one session of like many sessions of Basically, we're going to talk about the same things, but differently all through the study. Now we think you can take it. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as your program of recovery. Program of recovery. Recovery means, here's some steps. Recovery doesn't mean I'm fucking sober. Recovery doesn't mean I just go to meetings. Recovery means to me, here's the steps. That's recovery. One, we, had, we were uh, admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Remember, unmanageability for you, go to page 52 and look at the bedevilments. There's your unmanageability. You too. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. The first power that we get restored to sanity with, well, the... Sanity we get restored to is not picking up the first drink. God restores us to the sanity that this is not fucking a good idea. Mm -hmm. The real sanity is I don't run my own life, which is what step three is really about. So that's the real sanity. The insanity is, is that when I run my life, I create anxiety, fear, depression, resentment, hatred, not just to you, because whatever I fucking resent in you and hate in you, it's actually I hate it within myself. I just can't see that yet because I haven't done enough work. But eventually, the person will see that. So if you're resentful at somebody or you're hating on somebody or you're fucking like really not liking something external, it's really the problem isn't out there. It's inside. But there's work to be done so you can find that at some point. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God in direction as we understood him. Made a decision to do that. So if I make a decision to take a drink of that fucking coffee right there, and I don't fucking take a drink, then I haven't done anything. I've made the decision and done fuck all about it. So that is like in every moment of our lives when we're living this program, I can make a decision to turn it over. But if I don't know how to do it, then I won't fucking do it. And my ego thinks that it's done it, but I really haven't done it. So then I fucking suffer. And then when I think, oh, fuck, is this all the program has mm -hmm. to offer? I fucking turned my will and my life over every fucking day. Every morning I turn it over. Well, what's step 10? This is one of my key questions to anybody. What's step 10? Uh, I don't know. I know for sure you're not fucking turning it over. If you do not know what step 10 is, I'm fucking almost guaranteed you don't fucking have a clue what turning it over is. And if you say, I promptly admit that I'm wrong, you're fucking wrong. And if you say, I do a nightly inventory, then I know you've went to fucking treatment or you've been in a fucking meeting that treatment center people are coming to constant and you don't get step 10. Because if you don't get step 10 out of the book, you're not getting step three. Facts. Um, made a decision to turn it over, <clears throat> made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Yeah. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory, pretty basic, admitted to God, to ourselves and other human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Think about that. The exact nature of our wrongs. The word nature means origin of, but you're not really getting to the origin of your wrongs in your first set of steps because the first set of steps just clear the surface and you will not get to the origin of your defects in your first set of steps you will barely scratch the surface on the origin of them on your second set of steps because the origin of your defects come from the instincts which are described on the first page and a half of the step four in this book this 12 and 12 so if you want to get an idea of what is actually driving your whole fucking life, because it is not your conscious mind, your conscious mind and the decisions that you think you make are not actually what's driving your life. First page and a half of step four in here will describe what actually is driving your life. It's your subconscious need for whatever it is in your instincts.
Six, we are entirely willing to have God remove all these defects of character. First, you got to know what they are. Seven, on our knees. Humbly on our knees. Ask him to remove our shortcomings, holding nothing back. That Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. Humbly on your knees. Asking God to remove your shortcomings, holding nothing back. Think about that level of surrender. That's step seven, surrender. Step six and seven, everyone thinks they're the same kind of thing. They're fucking nothing close to each other. They are much different from each other. And if you stay at the study and you keep coming, you'll see that by the end of step seven, for sure. They're much different. That one is full surrender to God. Eight, made a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make complete amends to them all. So by the time you get to step eight, most people are scared of eight and nine. You won't be scared if you've done the work properly. You will not be fucking scared of any step if you've done the work properly and you've had enough humility on the way. Or you might have a little bit of fear, but you've got a connection to a God that you're able to pull through right. and use that power to face the fear, do the amends and create a new experience and grow your came to believe, think of your idea of God. And four. Nine made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So that a lot of people think that that's what step 10 is because that's what it says. But in the book, it actually has a little five-step process that's very exact. That is the keys to the kingdom. Remember earlier tonight, I said, out of all the fluffy shit in the book, there's like certain things that are exact. In step 10, there's an exact process. And if you can follow the exact process to the best of your ability, but fucking try really hard, it'll change your fucking life. I fucking shit you not. But if you do this one, it won't change your life. <laughs> 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. I want to reread that and say something else. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry out step six and seven. That's what we're praying for. The power to carry out the change of our old ideas, six and seven. Twelve, having had a spiritual experience as the result of this course of action, we tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So you have the spiritual awakening, spiritual experience as the result of doing the work in the program, not as a result of going to meetings. Um, and then you carry the message to other people. What's the message of the big book? One word. That's it. You carry the message of love into all your activities. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will. What's God's will? God's will is love always into all of our activities. That's a step 10 promise because step 10 actually will produce that. And I was going to say the part about the praying only for in step 11, praying only for knowledge of his will for us. So we're praying for like the next step, the next direction and how to carry that out. So how do we move forward with love to carry that out, whatever that is. And that's all we're praying for, not like what we think we want or what we think we need. And, and that's what we're moving into with the actor is like we're not running the own our own show we don't know if our child needs to be in this relationship you know i have i have you know things that i want for my kids but i don't know if that's best for them so i don't pray for like what i want for them i pray for you know the to support them and to be able to carry love into my interactions with them and to carry a message of whatever it needs to be that isn't my opinion and so letting go of outcomes and trusting that God has, you know, the layout, what I need to do for the day. And I only need to do that to the best of my ability. And that's all. 
and not to pray for all of those other things. And that's exhausting. And it was a relief. It's a relief to just simplify it like that and just to stay in today. You may exclaim, what an order. I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is, is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. That's the point. The point is of this program that you're just willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. So a lot of times in the program, you hear people say, oh, just progress, not perfection. No, it actually says it's we claim spiritual progress, not perfection. So what does that even mean? It means that we're as we're going through our journey of life and we kind of examine what we're doing in our life so we can try to become a little better from looking at what we've done or how we've harmed or what we're doing in our day-to-day -day operation of life. So not just to go through life and be resentful and not do anything about it, to go, why am I resentful? You know, to when you act out and call someone an asshole by accident or give someone the finger, you don't just fucking give them the finger and then go to the meeting and say, yeah, I gave this guy the finger today and I fucking, it's progress, not perfection, right? And then you're giving the guy the finger all day long, everywhere you go. No, it's like, stop, man. Why am I giving this guy the finger? Am I willing to give up this defect? Am I willing to actually look at what's going on? And maybe you won't figure it out right then, but are you willing? We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. I just want to say something here. Okay. Um, so, and this, this whole paragraph here, it can be used, commonly used in two ways where it's like, it's the guy that's justifying his shitty shit, right? Like I just give this guy the finger, we're not saints, whatever. But also like on the other end, which is just as, just as much ego, just in a, the pride in reverse thing where you've got the depressive side who beats themselves up and it's like the self-critic. And they're just always on themselves. And it's like, no, that's not what we're doing here either. Like, we're not saints. We're, we're just, you know, we're trying to grow along spiritual lines, period. Don't beat yourself up. Because that's just as much ego as the guy who's like, no, we're not saints, you know. So to have the true humility is like, when we mess up, we look at it. We look at it. We take it for what it is. And we try to do better. We're trying to grow along spiritual lines, period. Right. So our description of the alcoholic. Step one. That is our description of the alcoholic. You got the doctor's opinion. There's a solution. Bill's story and more about alcoholism. That's really important, okay, of the alcoholic. Uh, chapter to the agnostic, step two. And our personal adventures before and after have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. A, that you're alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism crazy fucking thinking and that God can and will period. So that's saying what it's saying there is you read the chapter, the first two chapters and you get to this point. All of what we've read is designed to sell you on these three pertinent ideas that you're an alcoholic and you can't manage your own life. And when, why I said, look on page 52 is because you'll see the unmanageability of what we're talking about. There's eight things and I call it the step zero promises. And if you're living in the step zero promises, your life's fucking unmanageable. That's guaranteed. And that little aspect of the big book, step page 52, is your barometer. You should always go back and read page 52 to see where you're at in your recovery. Why? Because you can rationalize and justify the most errant bullshit in your life to suit what the fuck you're doing in your life. But when you get rigorously honest and you look at those eight things in like a year, job's going good. You're fucking here. You're doing this. You're doing that. But you're fucking living like six out of those eight. You better be fucking beware. beware. Because your mind will trick you and think you're doing better. But get honest with yourself and look at those. Then you better get fucking... Off get, banana peel trail. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway god can and will and no human power that's the other thing in that step one it's taught you hopefully no human power is gonna fucking relieve your alcoholism 
No human power is going to fucking help you fucking overcome this illness. And that God can and will. So those A, B, and C, a lot of people in the rooms, you'll hear it's step one, two, and three. It's not step one, two, and three. It's step one, one, and two, or one, two, and two. But it's not step three at all in the A, B, and C. Okay? And here we go. If you are not convinced of these three vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point, or else throw it the fuck away. If you aren't convinced of A, B, and C, and I always ask somebody when I take them through this material, I stop right there and I'm like, are you fucking convinced of A, B, and C? And if you are not convinced on these three vital issues, and again, the word vital means fucking important, but it comes from the word vitality, which means giving life, living your best life. You ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. And if you are convinced, you're now at step three, which is you made a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him. Just what do we mean by that? Just what do we do? So now it's saying, we're going to tell you what we mean by that, turning it over, and what do we do? So it's just getting into the beginning parts of how to do that, right? Most people never really go into the depth of that. They just think they did because they prayed in the morning and they want to, but it actually takes, like Janine talked earlier, action, working with God and then the action through the working with God and then the action, you fucking can do this. But just the idea that you're doing it isn't enough. That's God as a concept. Okay. So the first requirement, you guys all know I'm a word guy. Requirement means a fucking necessity. This is the first requirement, the first absolute that you see any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Have you seen that your life run by you is not really successful? Toby? Fucking guaranteed. Right? So when I got to this point in my recovery and I was reading this, I was like, yeah, I can see my life's not very successful. But I didn't fully get it yet. I thought it wasn't successful because I was a crackhead, but I wasn't fully convinced that my life wasn't successful because I had actually built a business and I had a million dollar house and I had all those things that weren't that far away from me still because I came in here with nothing, but I still was pretty good at self-will. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't convinced that my life ran on self-will was hardly a success. Where that's really cemented itself is in sobriety. In sobriety, I have proven that my life run by me is not fucking successful. So this will grow on you through time. So on that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives may be good. So I ask you guys, are you in collision with something or somebody? Are you fucking at odds with people all the time? These are questions to ask yourself, right? What are you guys laughing at? <laughs> even though our motives and i don't like that he put motives i always say intentions what he wrote motives even though our intentions might be good most people try to live by self-propulsion each person is like the actor who wants to run the whole show is forever trying to arrange the lights the ballet the scenery and the rest of the players in his own way if arrangements would only stay put if people would only do as he wishes the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. And trying to make these arrangements or actor may be sometimes quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, dishonest. But as with most humans, he is more likely to have varied traits. Okay, I'll give you a story. Go for it. Mike? Mike's excited. He's like, oh, God, a story of where you ramble on. He's like, you didn't get to the point. <laughs> okay, so my mom um, was telling me about just her wedding and why she got married to my dad, and she's divorced now. But she described this whole fiasco that reminded me of this paragraph. And, and so my dad had Christian parents, and they really believed in like, you have a Christian family and you wed and, and that's how it is. 
And then my mom's parents, they just wanted her to be taken care of and not be a single mom or whatever. So she was pregnant with me. And then you had both sides for different reasons pushing this wedding. And so she was feeling pressure and she says, oh, I didn't want to get married, but it was like, I didn't want to let, let Herman and Audrey down, my dad's parents, because they wanted me to, to, you know, do, 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 do. And I, my dad was really pressuring me over here. And my mom was saying all of these things and everybody just, so you have like four directors in these parents where it's like, they're all trying to run the show with good intentions and their good intentions are that they want me to be taken care of. They want my mom to be taken care of. They want to be a good Christian family because they believe that's what's best for everybody. So you have all these competing demands with good intentions coming at each other and they're stepping on toes and stepping on toes. And then you have my mom in the middle of it who re recalls she doesn't want, she didn't want to get married, but she was people pleasing. So she was doing some fear-based people pleasing and she didn't want to speak up for herself because she didn't want to, you know, hurt anybody's feelings and she so she acted in that and so it goes on to say like what happens the show doesn't come off very well but we look at it and it's like we can't blame this parent or that parent or this in-law or that in-law because didn't we at, at that point get the ball rolling when we acted in fear and we didn't stand up for ourselves so everybody was stepping on toes in that scenario and she ends up being really hurt and the the divorce comes and she went through a period of time where she was blaming you know if they hadn't pressured me and if it but at the end of the day she made the decision and I just thought that when she was telling me that I said that's a good example of you know some of our literature where everybody came at that trying to nobody was trying to hurt you and nobody was trying to set you up for failure it was that everybody was coming at it because they cared about you and loved you and they thought that they knew best but they're not God and they don't see the whole thing. And so they were pushing at this something, stepping on each other's toes all over the place. And the show did not go off as planned. So what usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think that life doesn't treat him right. <clears throat> he decides to exert himself more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case might be. Still, the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is his basic trouble? Is he not a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if only he manages well? Is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things that he wants? And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not, even in the best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Okay, I'm going to go back up a little bit to where Janine was talking. Um, we're talking about the actor. So a lot of times in the meetings, you hear the person get up to the podium or they start sharing their, like, oh, I'm the director. I'm the director in my life. I'm dire the director in my show or whatever, right? Well, it doesn't talk about a director here. It's the actor. A director actually has the part where he's allowed to kind of direct the show and tell you. The actor is just another actor with all the rest of the actors, and he's trying to fucking tell all the other actors how to run the show. He doesn't even have the authority as a director. So the person who shares as the director in the, in the meetings, they're kind of off the mark a bit. Meaning like, no, we're just all the same. And... The actor is trying to run another actor. Okay? If people would only do as he wishes, the show would be great. So if everybody would just do as I wish, the fucking show is going to be good. So how did that work for me in my life? Well, I had my wife, Shannon, and I had my three daughters, and I had people that worked for me. And if they would just do the shit that I wanted the way that I wanted it, they'd be fucking happy for sure. Because I know that if you do it my way, you're going to be happy because I know what's best for all you guys. And we'd all be happy. So, for example, let's say we wanted to go on like a fishing trip because we did lots of fishing. And it was like a Saturday morning. And we decided we were going to go in the morning, me and Shannon, as we talked. I'd be like, okay, kids, if you get your bedrooms clean, we'll fucking go fishing. Shannon, you got to fucking do your stuff and I'm going to do my stuff. No one tells me what to do, though, right? I just tell everyone else what to do. So Shannon, you do your stuff. What do you got to do? Okay, you do that. Kids, you do your stuff. So, and then if we do that, I'll buy you guys McDonald's and we'll go fishing. 
maybe I'll buy you guys each a new fishing rod. So everyone's happy, right? But the kids are kids, so they don't really fucking clean up properly the way that I want. So I'm getting pissed off. And then the next thing you know, they're fucking outside playing and they're supposed to be in their bedrooms cleaning their bedrooms. And I'm just like, for fuck's sakes, what are you fuckers doing? Right? And then my wife's out there playing with them too. And I'm just fucking in the house, losing my mind going, fuck, you guys not get it? Right? So, so here I am trying to be the actor. And I'm quite virtuous. I'm going to buy them stuff. I'm fucking going to buy you new fishing rods. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in a nice and really kind way. But if I don't get what I want, now I'm like yelling out the window, okay, if you guys don't get your fucking rooms cleaned, I'm not taking a McDonald's. Yeah, no, no fucking fishing rods. You know what? Actually, we're not fucking going. You know what? I'm going. See you the fuck later. And I fucking go fishing by myself. And then I'm angry and I'm indignant. But I'm trying to get it my way. I'll, I'll start by being nice. So think about your own life. And you, whoever you deal with in your life, and you want what you want. What do you want? You want love? You want affection? You want a fucking back rub from your partner? What is it that you want? And then you're going to be really nice because you're trying to get something. Then if they don't give it to you, you kind of get agitated, a little bit frustrated. And then you're like trying to, now you're going to try to manipulate with a little bit of fucking anger, a little whatever it is, right? Maybe they fucking come and give you that rub because they see that you're agitated and you're just like, Leave me alone, fuck, right? I had a call from... That's called mind and emotional manipulation. It's called mind and emotional blackmail. That is us running the fucking show. Mm. That is how we fucking act in self. My intentions are good, but my motives are based in selfish, self-centered behavior. Because I want what I fucking want. It can be at work. It can be with your boss. It can be with a coworker. Maybe you want someone to do something for you or somebody's really good at something. So you on purposely don't do that. And maybe you don't come in that morning because you know that someone else is going to do it and they'll do a better job. I get, this is really cunning. This is the cunning and baffling part of alcoholism. I just want to flip this for a minute for a sec. Um, I had a call from somebody in program uh, a month or so ago and she was really upset um, with her, this family thing that went down and she was just telling me about it and describing the scene. And when she had concluded that um, her sister had acted in a, reve a revengeful way to get back at her for some reason, but she couldn't figure it out what, what it was. And so I said, okay, let's unpack this a little bit more because like, it's almost always that their intention is good. Like people are not psychopaths out trying to get us. Like there, there is that, there is that. And usually it's an ex, <laughs> but for the most part, people are really just out there trying to be helpful and they think they're coming at things in a way that's going to be helpful. And so anyways, as we unpack the story, it was that the two sisters had come home and they hadn't seen each other for a bit. And the mom was there and they were talking and they had said, you know, like, I just really don't want to support her her weed and her cigarettes and the other sister was like yeah I don't want to support her weed and her cigarettes either and they just kind of had a bonding moment of validating each other about how stressful that was and then and then this girl that had called she goes out for a bit well the sister takes it upon herself to tell the mother you know like we feel this way that we really don't want to be supporting your habits and this is really stressful on us and then this girl comes back and all hell breaks loose, right? And she thinks the sister is just out to get her. But really what was going on is that that the sister saw this as an opportunity to, to you know, come together and, and make an intervention. And that the mom was going to say, oh, I didn't realize that I was causing you so much stress. And I didn't, I see that you can't afford it. And oh, I see how it's affecting you. And you know what? I'm going to quit smoking and I'm going to quit smoking weed. And thank you so much, girls, for coming together. And but what happens? The show did not go off that way. And the mom is angry. And then the sister's angry. And everybody's stepping on toes and screaming at each other. And the show just did not go down the way that it was supposed to. And, and that wasn't because the sister was trying to screw her over. The sister was trying to bring harmony and, and was playing God in doing so. And so, like, I, I use this to, you know, really help people explore the motives of, of what's going on and where their resentments are coming from with family members too. Cause like 
this stuff applies to everybody out there. Like it's not just alcoholics that are trying to run their own show that are out trying to do things with best intentions and we step on each other's toes. So it's, it's helpful to look at things from another angle. Yeah. And so good point. Um, this spiritual malady doesn't just infect us as alcoholics. We just take it to the extreme and it's actually can be fatal for us. Right. But a lot of people suffer with self, which is based on your spiritual malady. And, uh, the other thing I'll say about self, because this is what we're talking about, right? When we talk about selfish self-centeredness in the alcoholic, this is kind of it. And it actually is deeper than this, but this is a good um, way for us to begin looking at it. And I'll say this, in order to really start uncovering self, it's going to take you probably two, three years minimum to understand the depth of self where it can really fucking help you like really start living your best life takes a couple years and that couple years it only comes if you're working like the real program if you're working the theory of the program you will be fucking in for a long fucking hard road that's why i'm all about the directions you follow these directions to a fucking t to the best of your ability and you're not a fucking saint you do this to the best of your ability and you understand what the directions are in the book and you do the things you will un understand self probably within three years. And then the rest of your life can be not a cakewalk, but pretty fucking easy compared to not understanding self. And just like she said, living your life with the best of intention is different than understanding the mode if that's under the intention. Because everyone is trying to be helpful, most people. They're trying to fucking live their best. And they're trying to help you. And you're trying to help people. But when you're able to see the motive underneath that and how you step on the toes of people with your self-centeredness, with your self-seeking, with the self-centered fear, with self-righteous anger, with fucking passive-aggressive anger, that's passive. You. That's you. <laughs> Should we get into what you are? <laughs> <laughs> I avoid and it works good because you do you and then I just avoid you. Oh and then we God. come back and we're all good. <laughs> anyway, we're not done yet. So don't close your book. She already read the paragraph. So we've got to finish it. But we're going to finish this paragraph. What usually happens? Well, the show doesn't come off very well, right? He begins to th think that life doesn't treat him right. Think about that in your own life. Fucking life's not treating me right. Look at these fucking people. Fucking my job. They don't even see my worth. Fucking, but when I got hired there six months ago, this was going to change my life. Now, six months later, I'm ready to fucking skid out of here because they don't see my worth. I need a fucking raise. They don't even fucking tell me I'm doing a good job anymore. Fuckers. To be in your relationship, right? Relationships are always like that with an alcoholic. You get into them. The ego loves it, and the ego loves the chase of the relationship because it's all ego power and control. And then six months, eight months, maybe a year, I doubt if it lasts a year, but then the shine wears off because that's what you're after was the power and control. But now there's no more of that. Or and if there is, it destroys the relationship. <laughs> so most alcoholic relationships usually don't really go very well because it's all based in self. Mm. Okay. And the person who's attracted to you isn't really that healthy either, or they wouldn't be with you. Water finds its own Facts. fucking level. Facts. Water finds its own level, always. The goal in this program is to level up so you can find a fucking partner and friends that are actually vibrating up here, that are living more with love, less fear, less, less manipulation, so that you can fucking actually have vulnerable relationships and trust people. Because that's what life is really about, right? But we all think that life's people who aren't trustable and they are going to fuck us. And, but we got to change those old ideas because that's not true. So he thinks that life doesn't treat him right. He decides to exert himself still more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demand. So he redoubles his effort out more control. As the case may be, still the play or life isn't suiting him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, fucking rarely, rarely does an alcoholic admit they're at fault, but this guy actually is admitting he's somewhat at fault. Um, 
but other people are more to blame. Fuck yeah. It's always other people. They're way more often to blame than me. I might see my part a little bit, but fucking it's usually you guys fucking me way more than I fuck me. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. Boom. That self-pity fucking defect of character is so sneaky. Watch for that. Watch for that. Because it, it'll infect you guys. Infects all of us. Poor me. Fucking poor me. Nobody wants me around or whatever it is, right? Just watch for it because it's a sneaky fucker and it's the worst one. Mm -hmm. It'll fuck your life right mm -hmm. up. And that's why you have a sponsor and you do the steps because you can fucking expose this shit. Left your own mind. It fucking hides behind pride and self-righteous anger and shit. Um, what is his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when he's trying to be kind? I love that line. So when you're going out in the life and you're trying to be kind, ask yourself, what am I trying to get out of this? It's a barometer question. What are you trying to get out of being fucking nice to somebody? Are you messaging somebody for something and you're trying to be nice and sweet? But really underneath it, the motive is I fucking need something. What is it? Okay, mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my mom a call. Fuck, I'm actually been broke, but I'm, you know, what's her birthday coming up? Ah, oh, fuck, hi, mom. Your birthday's coming up, hey? Yeah, yeah. My motive, my intentions are good. Yeah. Fuck, uh, you know, I'm fucking a little broke. Do you think I can come over for supper? Of course my mom's going to let me come over for supper. But that's why I call. I wasn't actually calling her to wish her happy birthday early. I needed something to eat. Or may maybe and my other hope is I know she's going to give me 20 bucks because my mom always feels sorry for me. So if she gives me the supper, I know she's going to give me 20 bucks. And if she and if I can kind of manipulate it a little bit more, maybe she gives me 100 bucks. Because every now and then she'll give me 100 bucks. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to borrow some gas off my neighbor. I'll be up there later. Every part of that had self, 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 mind and emotional manipulation. I'm stepping on the toes of her. And then I get there, made me craft dinner, gives me five bucks, says I got to go. I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> what a fucking bitch. So then I'm talking to my buddy, mom's fucking bitch, right? She, I stepped on the toes of her. She retaliated. And I'm like, what did I do? I was just trying to give my mom some love and telling my friends, she fucking called her and wished her happy birthday. Fucking, she made me craft dinner, tells me she's got to fucking leave. What a fucking bitch she is. But that little example plays out in many areas of our life, right? You just got to find out where it's playing out in your life and what self-seeking motive is that you're trying to get. Maybe it's just a pat on the back. Maybe you're doing something at work and you have to fucking let people know, right? Um, is, uh, is he not a victim? This is the keys to this whole program. Is he not a victim of a delusion? That he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well. This is one of my favorite lines in all of the big book. Is he not a victim? Look up the word victim and it says somebody that's been tricked or duped. Of a delusion. And a delusion is an idea that you believe to be true. But when you examine the evidence of this idea or situation, it's actually not true. But then you still believe that it's true. Is he not a victim of this, a victim, tricked or dupe of a lie that he can rest? Look how they spelled rest, W-R-E-S-T, which means to snatch, pry, grab, take, rip, wrestle, life, um, satisfaction, happiness out of life. So am I not fucking been tricked of a fucking lie that if I just manipulate and go get and twist and grab and manipulate the world to give me what it is I think I want? that I'm going to be happy and satisfied. Yeah, I'm a victim of it. I fucking spent many years being a victim of that. The first time when I quit drinking and I asked God to help me not drink ever again, he did. And then I looked at the world. I was 22 years old and I'm looking at the world going, okay, now I don't drink and I'm fucking untreated alcoholism is on me because just because I don't drink doesn't mean I ain't going to suffer. So then I'm looking for relief because an alcoholic always needs relief. And what does they get relief in? Usually the world of the material and relationships. So then I'm looking at the world and I don't understand the disease. 
And I'm like, okay, I need to get rich. I need to make money and get fucking some stuff because TV and the billboards and social media and my parents and everyone told me if I have the house and the relationship and the car and the business and the money, I'm going to be happy and satisfied. So then I dropped everything and I fucking worked my ass off to build all that shit. And I had it all. And because it didn't work, I lost it all. But I was the victim of that delusion. That if I had all that stuff, I could be happy and satisfied. But for the alcoholic addict, the pursuit of that is what fucking drives me. But I'll step on the toes of you guys to get that shit. And I was really in many aspects alone. But my wife was really supportive of me, even though she walked on eggshells because of my anger. And my kids had no choice because they're my kids. So, you know, but it wasn't until I burnt it down with crack because then I need a new substitute because dr- money doesn't work. The fucking stuff doesn't work. The house doesn't work anymore. The shine wears off of everything. And then I smoked crack at 36 years old and I found my new solution until that one didn't. But what the benefit of uh, crack was it took me from here to here really fast. And then I was fucking broken. And I could fucking then begin to fucking look within myself and get happy. That's how that worked for me. So most of us are victims of the delusion. We just got to see what lies we're living on. And we got to see what delusions, because I'm driven by fear and self-delusion. We got to see what fears and what self-delusion am I living on? And what am I trying to rest and grab and manipulate and pry and be the actor in my life? That's not serving me or anybody else. How can I live way more out of, because that's all based in fear. How can I live with more love and vulnerability? Well, it doesn't really make sense at first to go that road because you leave yourself open and vulnerable. And that's too scary. It's too scary to fucking tell somebody the truth. Like I fucking, I'm really scared to actually talk to you because I'm afraid that I'm going to get fired. Or I'm really scared to talk to you because I'm afraid that you're going to fucking think less of me. Right? That's really hard to do. But that's what the heart wants. And that's what other people want to hear. But because we've been raised in a society that doesn't do that, it's hard for us to do. So we'll just do what we've always done. We'll lie. And I won't get into conflict with you. The problem is when I try to avoid conflict with you, I never avoid the conflict because the conflict's always in my own self. Which is why, I'm just going to take us home now, which is why it says, is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Because we are not speaking up and we're not following God's will. We're following our will, which is based in self, which is based in fear. And we should end there because it's time. Yeah.